GDOC 2020, calling all psychonauts, because we're about to go on a fantastic voyage with our next presentation, The Art of Psychonauts 2, The Making of Brain in a Jar. Now, we're about to get an inside look at the pre-production and production processes of the development of the Psychonauts 2 level Brain in a Jar, which debuted at the Xbox Game Showcase this summer. Now, our presenter is an art director with 20 years of video game development experience. She has worked on some of the highest profile titles, including Tiger Woods Golf, The Simpsons, Dante's Inferno, Dance Central 3, Sims 4, oh, South Park, and many more. She's currently working on Psychonauts 2 with Double Fine Studios, and she's also an instructor and board member of GameHeadsOakland.org, which is a game development accelerator program for Oakland youth. She's also joined by senior concept artist Emily Johnstone. Give it up for the fine folks from Double Fine. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Yeah, that was very <laughs> nice. <laughs> I don't know if I have to follow that. All right, well, uh, I got makeup on and I'm dressed, so let's do this. <laughs> All right, so um, I think it's really hard to start to have this conversation without looking at the work. Um, if you're not familiar with Psychonauts, I think the best way to kind of get used to that is to just look at our wacky trailer. So we'll start there and then we'll talk about the development process. It's been a long time since you got a visitor. I hope you don't mind poppins. Where are we? Shh. It's quiet, nice. Neither skip nor wound. Just a thought is all I've got. Now my covers grow. At the bottom of a lake, a frozen feeling. When my friends pulled me back up, I started. Lizette, that's a trippy trailer. That is trippy, man. <laughs> Where are we supposed to like 
Top that. I don't know. <laughs> so intro again, um, Lisette Digital Montgomery and Emily Johnstone. And we're going to talk you through the process of developing a level for Psychonauts 2. Um, but before we start that, you have to kind of understand what the hell you just saw. <laughs> and uh, I think for that, you need to understand that one. Graz is an acrobat who is 10 years old, who has psychic abilities. And he runs away from his family to go to a psychic summer camp. And there he meets his heroes, the Psychonauts. And it's on that adventure that he realizes that he can use his psychic abilities to heal people's minds. And through Psychonauts 1, you kind of go through several brains and you go through a journey of understanding how people are flawed and how you can help them fix their problems by entering their brains. And in Psychonauts 2, we go on the same journey, but with a different set of brains. And one of the brains that is really unique in our level is brain in a jar. So I think what's most important about Psychonauts 2 to understand is every brain looks different. So our Psychonauts development process had to be somewhat adaptable per brain, but we essentially had to kind of use the same level development process. So for Brain in the Jar, we worked with Emily Johnstone, one of our very talented senior artists. Uh, she's a senior concept artist, and she also took on the role of being a level lead for this. So I thought she'd be a great guest to sort of talk about some of the challenges that we both had together and with the team to solve this problem. So Brain in a Jar, it kind of starts off where Raz finds a brain in a jar that has been abandoned in a storage room that's just been there for who knows how long. And it's been alone for about 20 years, we assumed. So this story goes on in 1980. So we are thinking that maybe this brain happened in the 60s. So this is sort of where we sort of began with the idea of the level concept, that this is a brain that was stuck in the 60s and all it remembers is what happened in the 60s. So Emily, let's talk a yes. little bit about what we thought this brain's problem was as a result of him being trapped in a jar for 20 years. So when I uh, first got the prompt for this level, it was about synesthesia and it was about uh, a concert. And um, and if you don't know what synesthesia is, it's a, a really cool phenomenon where uh, like wires in your brain sort of uh, cross over. So like uh, so uh, sounds and sights can can sort of merge and uh, like there are people that think um, when they hear a number like an eight, they're always associated with blue. And this is like a really cool phenomenon. But when I first heard it as, as a concept artist, I was like really hesitant and kind of nervous because in video games, we only deal with like sound and sight and we don't really uh, delve into the taste and touch and, and, and smell and stuff. So. I, I, I was like, how are we going to do this, Is that This sounds hard. <laughs> um, so uh, what, can you do the next slide? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So first off, I did a whole bunch of um, mood boards. Um, I was looking at Yellow Submarine because Peter Max was one of the main inspirations for like Yellow Submarine. And that is cool and trippy and 60s and and all that stuff. So I did a lot of experimentation. I started out uh, doing some felt art because I'm like, let's let's touch things, and this felt can be like very tactile and cool. So I did these like uh, felt experimentations that uh, were inspired by Kandinsky, which is an artist of the 1900s, and they they thought that he had synesthesia um, because his paintings were so woo and crazy. Um, I then went to uh, Tilt Brush uh, and did some experimentations in VR because we had a whole bunch of like Oculus uh, devs or uh, dev kits at the time. So I was painting and Tilt trying to get a feel for like the level. Um, and, and I was even doing a little bit of experimentation with uh, photography because in Yellow Submarine, there's a lot of photography and mixed media in there. So um, if you go on to the next slide, uh, here, here's a, so what I ended up deciding or, or what I ended up pitching to everyone was, hey, what if all the uh, characters were associated with all the senses? So right here, here's, here's vision, vision, uh, this is vision quest. And um, so I was thinking that his world would be only green and, you could, and he, uh, 
he you know he's got an eyeball and 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 then uh, like a lot of the other characters like right. um, I think uh, it, just his own his own character design kind of immediately lent him to of course be the one we sort of focus on around site and so yeah. it really <clears throat> helped us to kind of separate uh, the senses with color as you can see in your little concept on the upper left um, sort of associate you know associating color with sense you know in the same way synesthesia works. Yeah, I was like looking at RGB and how those could sort of merge together and stuff. Um, I'll find your vitamin. Okay, oh, before we get into that one. So yeah. before we set this one up. So after we got through the site and we developed like what we knew what the level was going to be, uh, Emily had a demand and that was kaleidoscopes. <laughs> I wanted kaleidoscopes so badly. I went uh, to our uh, VFX artist at the time and I was like, Tazia, Tazia. We have to do kaleidoscopes because I like I, I don't see that in games very often. I can't think of I, there are probably games out there that use kaleidoscopes all the time, but I'm like I want a kaleidoscope. So he started developing uh, some kaleidoscope kaleidoscopic stuff, and yeah. the, the video next will show. Yeah. So we were trying to make sure we had a really cool transition. So the biggest part of surrealism, one of the biggest parts, is like playing with your sense of time and space. And your and your and your sense of where you are and what's real and what's not. So we wanted to use the kaleidoscopes as a way to transition into the various senses of the body. So watch this little video. I'll find your violin. Just tell me where you last used it. Can I even remember what it looked like? Yeah, if only you could see the world the way I see it. So um, so once we had that test, it was sort of like this proof that we knew we were going down the right direction. Um, and so we started just sort of applying this idea of surrealism and color as a sort of way to draw the player through the world. And that is sort of how the level just started to sort of take shape and sort of really become a 3D space. I'll play this one again. So. Um, this particular uh, montage is the right after you kind of enter the brain and you're moving forward, you kind of come upon this deity that represents, uh, you know, the, the the your ultimate object, which is you know trying to get to Vision Quest or trying to get to your shrine at the end of the level. And one of the challenges we had with um, using all one color everywhere was that all of a sudden things got became extremely flat. And two, reading your path was very challenging. Um, trying to know where you were, what the alpha path was, what was important to climb on, and what was just stressing was a little bit more challenging to read when you were running through gameplay. Um, so the other thing that we also ran into was that we became concerned that green was going to cause issues of color blindness. So that was another issue that we had to start tackling and figuring out how we were going to work with that. Um, by testing the level in various like colorblind filters and figuring out what we can do. And overall, we were wondering what, what the hell did we just do to ourselves? <laughs> we created a, um, more problems and we also kind of came up with some wonderful solutions and now we had to sort of really figure out how we we're gonna move forward with that. And so one of the ways we kind of made sure that the pathing was very understandable and, and readable was to maybe play around with what a path, what path was in the first place. So Emily, would you like to talk a little bit about the rainbow bridges a little bit? Sure. Um, they were something that I uh, we had originally uh, put in in the original concept drawings. They were uh, green rainbows at the time, like uh, shades of green. And Lizette was, um, everyone wanted rainbow rainbows. So uh, I think this like really helped uh, a stand out in a very uh, green centric world and um, yeah, I think I think the the end result turned out really fabulous. Yeah, so Tazio, that that first one is, was a test, and this is sort of the final look of where we kind of ended up. Um, fortunately, we don't have audio on this, so you can hear me talk. But as you hit each color, it plays a different note, so it's really fun to kind of jump around on the bridge. So and we kind of were able to kind of solve a solution, uh, come up with a solution for pathing and everything sort of being flat by making this path dynamic. Um, having the ambient movement kind of drew your eye to it as well. And then also just this really cool color effect, kind of really like a special moment when you get to these points 
in the level. So now that we had a sense of what the level was going to be, the next challenge we knew we had was, you know, not every level in Psychonauts has a new power, but some do. And we knew this one was going to have one because this, this brain has such a special challenge. And it became pretty clear we like to think of this brain as a time travel level more than anything else because you're going back to the 60s and you're moving through time. So the power idea around time bubble sort of came, became a concept with the team. Um, through some early prototyping, you know, being able to just kind of slow things down really slowly um, in our prototypes is very helpful. Um, and also looking at our prototypes and figuring out what we can do with color to make the player understand like when things are slowed and when they're fast. So we didn't have to just rely on motion. Tim really wanted this power to sort of slow things down and reveal things that you wouldn't normally see at normal speed. So after our initial test by Tazio, we kind of got very encouraged about using this power, not only on the environment, but also on characters. So we started exploring with various prototypes on uh, one of our uh, designers, uh, Joshua and Jane, and our other designer, James, worked really hard at coming up with various scenarios that we can use this in the environment. So the propeller is one of those. And then our combat designer, Lauren, is, was also tasked with coming up with a design for the enemy for this level. And the enemy for this level is the panic attack. Um, Emily, you want to talk yeah. about panic attack? Um, panic attack, uh, we had a kind of difficult time trying to figure out what um, her uh, outer shell would be. And um, we ended up doing uh, some chromatic aberration, almost like a beetle, because it was just so um, overwhelming with sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun kind of thinking about what this character was and how it moves around. And Lauren sort of, sort of imagined this character as a very spastic creature that kind of jolts about and tra teleports um, because that's how panic attacks feel. It feels like they're just coming on and throbbing and you know, coming in and out and you just feel chaotic and out of control. So we wanted this enemy, enemy to really feel like that. This is an early test. So you see like the chromatic aberration happening. Um, the Afi effects of the character is also extremely trippy. Um, it's almost like this uh, subtractive shader element going on with the effects so you're getting this bleeding ink. Um, so we just always wanted to make it feel like this thing could overtake you and just sort of consume you with darkness. Um, very similar to how a panic attack feels. So that's a really, really quick rundown of uh, what we did for one level in Psychonauts 2. Um, like I said before, every brain in Psychonauts 2 is different, so no other level looks like this one. So you look out for more talks and more like sharing with the rest of the team on uh, over the next few months as we head toward release. Um, and we are just really happy to share our story with you guys at Game Devs of Color. I've been wanting to come out to this conference for a very long time. Um, and I'm hoping that I will get to see all of you in person next year. And thanks again to our, my wonderful concept artist, Emily Johnstone. Thank you. Thanks, Lizeth. That was wonderful. Yes. Oh. Wow. Okay. So uh, I totally have a thing about any game where I see so like eyes, like lots and lots and lots of eyes just uh, everywhere, like littered across the screen. Sometimes there are games that have enemies that are just like nothing but just eyes. And I got to say, it totally skeeves me out. That being said, I love that because I like when I play a game that makes me feel something on a visceral level in real life. So I, I'm actually very much looking forward to playing this game because uh, I think you've just done a really great job with just your, your play with color and time perception and how things just like the, the, the background looks like it's completely like blurry at times. and. I think the idea of playing with the different elements of the brain is just really, really phenomenal. I never got around to Psychonauts 1. I am, I'm thoroughly convinced that I'm going to pick it up 
just so I can go through it before two comes out. So thank you so very much. This was a really good look at what goes into just designing a level. Because sometimes I'm sitting there, I'm like, how do these people come up with this kind of stuff? And uh, this was awesome. So thank you very, very much. I'm certain that anyone watching this is going to be excited about playing this game when it comes out. So that being said, you can show your excitement by posting about this in the comments, sharing this, liking this, telling us how hype you are to see this game come out. And we just give a big thank you to Lizette and Emily for shorting the stuff and showing us what's gonna be coming out soon. So thank you very much.